This video is supported by Dashlane. In 1554, the ambassador to the Holy Roman Emperor Ferdinand I returned from Turkey, and he brought with him something that would soon spread all across Europe like the plague. Not the plague. Not this time, anyway. But like the plague. It was, it was a thing. It was a thing that everybody had to have. People were obsessed with it. Addicted, even. And no, it wasn't opium. This time. The thing that caused a mania and took over an entire continent and almost crashed the economy? The tulip. The tulip. The tulip was just new and unique to Europe. They'd never seen anything like it. The softness of its petals, the saturation of its color, and the word of its beauty spread around a lot faster than the actual flower did. This was the 1500s. Things just moved slower back then, but that just caused the anticipation to get their hands on a tulip to rise even further. And when you have something that's rare, that a lot of people want, the value of that thing will go up. And that's what happened with the tulip. Enter the Dutch East India Company, which was basically the Amazon of its day. They spread the tulip to every single corner of Europe and made boatloads of money while they were doing it. By the 1600s, the entire continent was wrapped up in tulip mania. At its height, one bulb of the Semper Augustus tulip went for 10,000 guilders, and just for context, a skilled craftsman of the day could make about 300 guilders per year. But people justify spending this kind of money on a tulip because they planned to cultivate it and sell the seeds later on. It was an investment, just like a home, and as prices continued to rise, they could sell the seeds and just make it rain guilders. They were speculating that their investment would pay off later on, and that's why some people call tulip mania the world's first speculative bubble. But just like the speculative bubbles that we're so used to today, the tulip bubble did eventually burst. The market fell out, and investors lost most, if not all, of their money. But on the subject of speculative bubbles, what's up with cryptocurrencies these days? About a year ago, I did a video about blockchain and Bitcoin, and I covered all the basics of how it works and how it kind of came about and everything. So if you're still not really familiar with blockchain, if it's still new to you, I'm going to just point you over to that video so that I don't have to explain it all again. It's, it's, it's all right there. Just, just go check it out and get the basics down. Because I hate repeating myself. I, I do. I, I, I hate, hate repeating myself. Hate it. Repeating myself. But maybe you're one of those people who have been following Bitcoin for years, shouting those praises from the rooftops, regaling your family on Thanksgiving in 2017 about the mysterious Satoshi Nakamoto and this currency that's going to overthrow the entire economic system that we know today. You watched as your block folio continued to rise in value, you started scoping out islands that you could buy, and you scoffed at other people for their belief in the <laughs> dollar. And then January 2018 happened. You watch those numbers go lower and lower and probably sink into a little bit of a depression as Bitcoin went from the height of $20,000 per Bitcoin to around $3,100. Bitcoin, why do you hurt me so? The enthusiasm for Bitcoin and other altcoins kind of fell off the map a little bit, and it didn't help that in the big crypto frenzy that was going on, there were a lot of scams and Ponzi schemes happening that were promising a Lambo in every garage. Uh, one notable one is BitConnect, which launched in this very measured and quiet fashion. So what's up, Bitcoinet? Wow! Bitcoinet! I love Bitcoinet! Sign me up. The good news is that this and other more questionable altcoins have kind of fallen by the wayside over the years. And in 2019, Bitcoin did have a little bit of a resurgence, though it was nowhere near a shadow of its former self. But, you know, advocates of Bitcoin continue to hodl and, and wait for the moon. That's crypto speak. In the meantime, while the markets have inflated, deflated, and eventually stabilized, there's been a lot of interesting things going on behind the scenes in the blockchain space. Here's just a few of them. Now before we jump in, I've got to issue the standard disclaimer here. This is in no way financial advice. I am not telling you to buy or not buy anything. If you're interested, do your own research, put whatever money you want to in there, but if you lose it, don't blame me. All right, now that my A has been C'd, let's talk about the basic attention token in the Brave browser. Websites cost money. Whether it's a whole team behind it that you've got to pay for, or if it's just hosting fees, something has to pay for it to exist. Smaller websites, blogs, that kind of thing, that can usually just be paid out of somebody's pocket. But as a website gets bigger, the costs scale up as well. And right now, there's basically three different ways that websites pay for themselves. 
The first is a paywall, a site that forces you to pay to view their content. Think of something like the New York Times or Wired. The second is a site that's free for you to view, but it's paid for with ads that bombard your eyeballs and even more valuable, collect data on you and your browsing habits. And the third is an optional donation for altruistic sites, which provide content for free without ads, but then ask for a voluntary donation in return, like say Wikipedia. All of these methods have their drawbacks. Either you're losing control of your data, you're dealing with ad-laden sites that are borderline unreadable, or you're dealing with sites that are constantly begging you for donations, which can get kind of annoying. And this is the problem that the Brave browser aims to fix with their basic attention token, or BAT for short. The BAT is a cryptocurrency that pays both the website and you for your attention. So let's say you go to your favorite website devoted to hairless cats, the Brave browser would get a little bit of BAT to the website, send a little bit of it to you, and it does it anonymously so your data is protected. Where is this money coming from, you may ask? Well, ads. It's always ads. But the ads appear in a pop-up notification that are out of the way and unobtrusive. In fact, the Brave browser comes with an ad block so that you don't have any ads actually on the page. And you get to pick how many ads that you see per hour. The more ads you see, the more bat you earn. And you can use that bat to pay off paywalls or set up a recurring donation to your favorite websites or just tip a website for a good article that you liked. The idea is it's kind of a different way of experiencing the internet, one that lets you reward content creators for the work that they do in the most seamless and unobtrusive way possible. This is, of course, just a basic overview of the Brave browser. If you're interested, I'll put a link down in the description so you can find out more about it. Another interesting project to keep your eye on is something called Chainlink. And Chainlink is an altcoin that connects smart contracts. I talked a little bit about smart contracts in my last video, but a smart contract is basically a digital contract that's kept in a blockchain. Blockchain at its core is basically a validating technology. So this is kind of like a digitally notarized contract that can't be changed once the two parties have signed onto it. The beauty of smart contracts is that you don't have to trust people. And wouldn't the world be better if we didn't have to trust people? I mean, trusting other people obviously is a good thing, but as any contractor can tell you, when that trust gets violated, uh, things can get ugly. I've had to deal with some unscrupulous people in my time, you know, people that wouldn't pay me for the work that I had done. And, you know, I've gotten lawyers involved, and usually what winds up happening is you wind up just dropping the whole thing because the cost of the hiring the lawyer and going to court and the time that it would take to get this money back is far more than the actual amount of money that you're trying to get back. So you eventually just walk away and take a loss. I'm not still bitter. I'm not still bitter, Steve. But with a smart contract, all the funds are put in right at the very beginning. And then the deadline and the deliverables are set. And when the contractor delivers the product to the client, then it automatically triggers the smart contract to pay that contractor and they go on their merry way. If the contractor fails to deliver by the deadline, then the money reverts back to the client. Sounds great, but the problem with smart contracts is how to actually create them. It kind of requires downloading a third party app and learning how to code these things. And I don't know about you, but that sounds way outside my skill set. But Chainlink aims to solve that problem by making it as simple as sending a PayPal payment request with a smart contract plugin. And they've been pretty successful with it so far, partnering up with Google and Oracle. Now one use case for Chainlink that's actually kind of interesting is with autonomous cars. We know self-driving cars are coming, and of course the idea is that they're going to make the roads a lot safer, but you know what? Things go wrong. Inevitably, accidents are going to happen. But self-driving cars running with insurance smart contracts could interact with the sensors and decide right then and there who is at fault, and then the payment can actually be transferred over to the other person right there on the spot. Smart contracts actually have a lot of really interesting use cases, including fully autonomous corporations where they actually use smart contracts in their supply chain to sort of go ahead and order and receive and do all that without any human intervention whatsoever. Ideas like Chainlink will only accelerate the use of smart contracts and make starting and running a small business even easier for budding entrepreneurs. The last project worth mentioning brings us back to Bitcoin, or more specifically, a project that's being built on the Bitcoin blockchain called the Lightning Network. Bitcoin has a problem, and it's baked into its foundation. If you watch my earlier video on this, you know that Bitcoin relies on miners. That's miners, not miners. Bitcoin doesn't use child labor. Miners are people who contribute their computers or create entire server farms to validate the blocks on the blockchain, and in return, they get a little bit of Bitcoin. The problem is the more activity on the blockchain, the more miners are required to validate the different blocks, or the more blocks need to be validated per miner. Either way, that costs money. It got all the way up to $54 per transaction at the peak of activity in December of 2017. In other words, using Bitcoin kind of breaks Bitcoin. 
The Lightning Network aims to fix this bottleneck by using hash Timlock contracts with bidirectional payment channels, allowing for payments to be securely routed across multiple peer-to-peer -peer payment channels. You know, that old chestnut. Guys, I'm going to be honest with you, some of this is about to sound like an instructional video for the retro encabulator, and I am just about as lost as you are. But basically, the Lightning Network makes it possible for anybody on the network to pay anybody else on the network, even if they don't have a direct channel with each other. It's actually an off-chain technology that allows you to trade bitcoins back and forth and then validate them on the blockchain later on when it's more convenient. In other words, the money changes hands immediately, instead of waiting 10 minutes or an hour for that transaction to be validated on the blockchain. Keeping in mind that 10 minutes or an hour is still faster than the 1 to 5 days that it can take for a payment to show up in a regular bank account. But the real power is that you can send payments to somebody even if you're not connected on the network. So let's say you're person A, and you're only connected to person B, but person B is connected to person C and D, and C and D are connected to Mr. E and Mr. F, Mr. F. And on and on from there. With the Lightning Network, you, person A, could send money to person Q without being personally connected to them. Right now, the Lightning Network can only handle a little over a thousand bitcoins, so it's still kind of small, although a year ago it could only handle a hundred bitcoins, so it is kind of proving itself to be scalable. I think what gets crypto enthusiasts so excited about this technology is it kind of turns our entire concept of money upside down. Like, what is currency? What is value? What's going to be valuable in the future? It may be that someday we'll look back on the idea of currency controlled by governments and banking institutions as just straight up crazy town. Like, why would you let somebody else control your money and decide who has access to it? The economy of the future may be entirely decentralized, allowing people to make their own rules and basically be their own bank. Or crypto could wind up going the route of the Semper Augustus bulb, you know wind up being a massive speculative bubble that looks really good at first, but then, you know, it wilts out in the sun and, and you don't water it and bugs start eating its leaves. This metaphor's been stretched. The important part here is that the financial system is still changing, and change usually occurs when the system isn't benefiting the majority of the population. We've seen one bubble after another, banks manipulating stocks and currencies through greed and speculation. It's easy to see why some people are ready to just throw the whole thing out and start over with something brand new and egalitarian. But we're still in the early days of crypto and blockchain. Where we go from here, we can only guess. Well, let me hear from you though. Are you into the crypto thing? Is there another application that you're more interested in that I didn't talk about here? Do you think the whole thing's a fad? Discuss it down in the comments below. Now, one of the major selling points for cryptocurrencies is its online anonymity. With data being big business and hackers around every corner, you want to make sure that you're safe and protected online. And one of the best ways to do that is with Dashlane. Dashlane is a password manager that makes getting around online simple and safe. Most of us have dozens of passwords to keep track of, and for a lot of people it's just easier to use the same password over and over again. The problem with that is, of course, if somebody gets your password, they can get into everything. But with Dashlane, every account can have a big, fat, and possible to guess password, but you only have to remember the one master password. Dashlane keeps all that information local to your devices, so nobody, not even Dashlane, can see them. And it goes way beyond that. Dashlane also offers a VPN feature so you can browse the web anonymously and keep those data vultures at bay. It even has a dark web monitoring, so if someone's buying or selling your information on the dark web, you can find out about it and put a stop to it. You can also store credit card and passport information on there, so Dashlane can autofill those on websites and you've got all that info in one secure place. I actually just started using Dashlane myself and I gotta say, it's, uh, it's pretty dope, as the kids would say in 1990. Viewers of this channel can get a 30-day free trial of Dashlane if you go to dashlane.com slash answerswithjoe. You can try it, install it, give it a look, see if you like it, and you'll get the dark web monitoring, the VPN, the password protection, all that. And if you sign up and stick with it, you'll get 10% off from that point forward. A little peace of mind goes a long way. So if you've never tried Dashlane, go ahead, give it a try. Dashlane.com slash answerswithjoe. Links down below. Big thanks to Dashlane for supporting this video and a huge shout out to my Patreon supporters, my answer files who are supporting this channel, growing a great community and really helping me out. I cannot thank you guys enough. There's some new people that have joined. Let me murder their names real quick. We got Edward Tomlinson, Greg Y, Matthias Simon, Brian Fennec, Tash, Corey Ruel, Zanette Zorzos, <laughs> real name, uh, Brett Messenger, Nancy Fraser, uh, Zachary Pegan Durastante, Raymond Ng, Linda E. Dewey, MD, Diego Rebuc, uh, Clay, Chris Ashton, and Aaron Bray. Thank you guys so much. If you would like to join them and get early access to videos and just access to me and the whole community, you can go to patreon.com slash answerswithjoe. As always, t-shirts available at the store, answerswithjoe.com slash shirts. 
fun, nerdy, you'll like it. Go check it out. I'm going to keep that part short. Please do like and share this video if you liked it. And if this is your first time here, hey, Google thinks you'll like this one. So you can take a look at that or any of the others down on the little sidebar. And if you do like them and you want to be able to see these, I do them every Monday and Thursday. I do invite you to subscribe. All right, thanks a lot for watching. You guys go out, have an eye-opening rest of the week, and I'll see you on Monday. Love you guys. Take care.